So, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to uh, welcome everybody here and on Zoom. Um, this is our inaugural uh, annual Raiseback uh, lecture series. Um, this has been supported by a very generous gift from um, uh, James and Sherry Raiseback um, that's supporting us. So, yeah. Um, so I really want to welcome our our inaugural speaker and and lecturer. I want to welcome Dr. Uh, Dracos from the University of uh, Utah. Um, he's a professor there. He's head of the MCS service and also co-director of the Transplant and Heart Failure Service. Um, he's an international expert um, in the area of myocardial recovery, a very important part of what we do. And that's what he's going to speak about this morning. So I, I want to uh, welcome Stavros and expect a great talk. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for this uh, wonderful invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm so glad to uh, have so many friends and uh, colleagues, and it's actually my first time um, visiting UW, and um, I'm really excited. Uh, we had a great day yesterday, and I'm looking forward to my uh, the rest of the day today. Uh, so, as Dan said, today we will talk uh, about myocardial recovery. And uh, these are my disclosures. And I like to start with this uh, illustration from this paper that Ken Margulis put out a few years ago. And the reason I like to start with this is it illustrates nicely in the outer ring the mechanisms by which heart failure and cardiac remodeling progresses. And in the inner ring, you can appreciate there the things we do on our everyday clinical practice to induce, to mediate, reverse remodeling, and get a bad heart to look a little bit better. And you can appreciate there simple things, like when we control the tachycardia in a tachycardia and use cardiomyopathy, when we do CRT, when we use RAS blockage or other interventions. And the dogma that prevailed, especially in the basic science world for long, that the human uh, failing heart cannot improve significantly after severe injury is really being challenged uh, by our everyday clinical uh, reality. And so a question relevant to our presentation today and our work in this field is which of those paradigms could be used as an investigational model in order to uh, provide us clinical and mechanistic insights. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the mechanical circulatory support and the ELVAD model can really help us uh, understand better how this uh, works. And I would also like to share with you this table, which is from a paper we put together a few years ago as well, where we reviewed in the first column and the text, of course, the various etiologies of heart failure. As we know, it's a heterogeneous disease. And you can appreciate there in the middle, also the two of the most common etiologies, which is the idiopathic diet of cardiomyopathy and the ischemic cardiomyopathy. But as you move from column to column, you will appreciate there the heterogeneity of the disease, in terms of the therapies we use, in terms of the responses to these therapies, in terms of the timing to the responses to these therapies, and in terms of the durability of the response. I mean, it's out of the scope to go through everything. The point that I would like to make is that this is a heterogeneous disease with highly heterogeneous responses to therapies. And we will get back to this later. So how does the heart fail? One of the major drivers of the forward remodeling is the excess load and the wall stress. And again, we're not gonna go through all of the literature supporting this, but it's one of the main drivers, as you can appreciate there, that gets this heart to look from an ellipse to a sphere. And this is a vicious cycle and the function and the structure deteriorate. So the left ventricular assist devices, they're doing two things. The first thing they do is that they remove a significant part of this load, as you can appreciate there. And the second thing they do 
is that they provide flow to the periphery. And you can begin thinking about reversing this process, not only in a cardiocentric way, but also in a systemic way. And <clears throat> this is a patient, and let's call this patient A. And we call him responder because as you can appreciate a few months after the Elvat went in, you can appreciate in the four chamber view how the heart is moving better. And this is another patient, let's call this patient B, who despite being sick with the same duration of disease, about two years, despite having the same etiology, idiopathic diet cardiomyopathy, and despite the duration of the intervention being the same a few months, you can see differential responses. Why these two hearts responded differently, we and others think that has far-reaching uh, translational and clinical research implications. So we put together a few years ago, more than a few now, this recovery program between our clinical programs in the Salt Lake Valley and many other collaborating institutions. And of course, we had on top of the clinical component, a scientific component to begin understanding the phenomenon. I'm gonna share with you uh, the majority of the clinical uh, work we've done and uh, some of our scientific basic work we've done in order to understand the, uh, this phenomenon. And I'm gonna go fast forward uh, to the multicenter trial we published about a year and a half ago uh, the restage trial, remission from stage D heart failure. And, and that was a study that we combined LVADs and standard heart failure mediations. And these were the inclusion criteria. And we enrolled 40 people. And this is the enrollment per site. And the inclusion criteria, as you can see there, uh, were non ischemic cardiomyopathy less than 60 years, low EF, cardiomegaly, but uh, Oh, something pop up here. Let me just close it. But the duration of heart failure was less than five years. And these criteria were informed by prior studies in the field by single center reports that they associate these characteristics with higher likelihood to reverse the model of the heart. And that's why we selected them for this multicenter study. These were the uh, criteria of recovery by hemodynamics and by echocardiography when you turn down the pumps. And uh, this again was informed by prior single center studies. And when the patient met this criteria, we went ahead and we removed the pumps. This is just a snapshot of some baseline characteristics. These were really sick people, as you can appreciate there, and the hearts were dilated. And uh, the protocol was, I would say, pretty straightforward like you and other uh, programs, we wanted to optimize the pumps to have the IVS in the middle so we can unload uh, uh, equally the left and the right side uh, and uh, minimize the MR. And by this, uh, we moved on to do screening uh, echoes uh, at the time intervals you see there. And then we use the standard heart failure mitigations. In the post restage era, we are using, of course, also Entresto and SGL2 to maximize the reverse remodeling. So these are the echo results from the core lab at Montefiore. And uh, you can see here the ejection fractions, uh, how in some people improve and some people did not improve. We will talk later about the time course of this improvement and the insights you can gain from that. And these are the volumes and the dimensions of the heart, how it changed in this multi-center study over time. And the result of this study, was that uh, almost one in two patients uh, met the criteria and their pumps were wind. And this took place in all six participating sites. Uh, and as we just reviewed, these restage patients were selected. So it's not an all cameras unselected population based on these characteristics. And, and the question that comes up regularly is just to grasp how this phenomenon can affect our field is, how about all cameras? How about all etiologies? We just showed before the heterogeneity and the etiologies of heart failure. And so we did this with Innova. And I think it's a pretty good uh, diverse sample. Back East, Innova, as you know, gets the patients from the greater DC area. And our program gets patients from all over the mountain west. 
all of the surrounding states. Plus, through RVA, we get patients from Houston and Dallas to Alaska and Hawaii. And we have lots of underserved areas, Native Americans, lots of people coming. So it's a pretty diverse uh, patient sample. Consecutive patients, we excluded the acute non-chronic patients. And we looked at the serial echoes in these people, 358. So what we found there was about 10% of these all comers, 10%, they shrink their heart to normal range and they improve the REF to more than 40%. And then we focus on the rest of the patients. And when we looked at the rest of the patients that they have not improved the REF to more than 40%, we found another 15% that they improved the EF by 10 absolute units, which as we know, in the CRT studies, the beta blocker studies, this is called super response. And we called them for the purpose of this study, partial responders. And then we found another 15% of patients that they improved the IDF 5 to 10%. And if you put these two groups together, when we investigated that, we showed that about this 30% had a median LVF increase of 9% and the range was 6 to 14%. And we'll get back to this and how this group uh, can be uh, an opportunity uh, later. But is this reproducible in other centers? That's a major point for everything that we do in academic medicine. And so consistent findings from Intermax, which is the National Registry of Elevates, as you know, uh, confirm that this is indeed uh, reproducible. These are two of the papers that I'm going to review with you. The important point is that these echoes that they analyze in these Intermax reports, the Columbian group and our group, are echoes that they have been performed and read in all of the hospitals that they participate in Intermax including UR echoes from UR institution. And uh, this is Omar Weaver Pinzon. He did this work when he was a fellow, now he's faculty with us. And uh, he started analyzing the data from Intermax. As we know, the explantation rate there, most programs don't have a recovery program. They focus on other issues and they have other research opportunities and uh, priorities. And so the explantation rate and the removal of PAMS was about 1%. And then he focused on the 7,000 of patients in Intermax that they had follow-up echoes. And so what he found there, consistent with the findings I showed you before, that there was another 12% of patients that they have an EF more than 40%. And also he found these partial responders that uh, we discussed, again, in echoes perform and read in hospitals all over the country. The Columbia group, Veli Topkara and Paolo Colombo and the team, got about the same time the Intermax data and they published similar results, again, showing these responders, partial responders and non-responders rate. Right? So that's what we get when we go and see unselected consecutive patients with LBATS. So this is a paper that just came out from Duke. And I think it's an interesting paper because in their population, this is a high uh, volume center. They found that these responders and these partial responders did better, not with winning the pumps, but just followed them chronically as destination therapy was breached to transplant patients, they had so much better outcomes than the rest of the elbow patients. And some people were like, but if you think about it, you should not be surprised. This is the patient that comes to clinic and eagerly asks you, is my EF better? Is my EF better? And when you tell them it's better, they high five with their spouse and they're so happy because they know, we all know that if the patient goes from 10% to 35 or from 8% to 29, you are a different patient. EF is not everything, but it's one of the markers that can predict better prognosis. So uh, Dan was uh, saying to me earlier about how he was calling in the early days of the field, Sharon Han. And when you talk to legends like Sharon, she asked me this question, Dan, five Gordon conferences ago, 10 years ago, is this phenomenon because of the mechanical unloading and the support and the flow to the periphery, or is it because now we can use mitigations, or is it both? So when I came back, I talked to Anna, he, she was a fellow at that time, and then she became the director of our ECHO lab, and she was good with ECHO, so Nazem knows Anna. And so uh, we said, let's do a study about it. We didn't have ICHT guidelines about LVAT patients at that point in time, and medical therapy could have been anything in LVAT patients. So we said, we're gonna get a bunch of patients, treat them with half your medications, and then we're gonna get another group that we're gonna leave them just with the VAT, control blood pressure with remodeling naive medications like calcium channel blockers and other things, and see what's gonna happen. And so when we did that, we found that it was both independently and synergistically. So the PAMS, as you can see there with uh, the blue, 
uh, they improve the LVDD and the LVF, and you can see the time course as well. And then as you would expect, adding anxiety modeling mitigations further and above and beyond improve the outcome. Answering Sharon's uh, question uh, uh, that uh, she was wondering about. So how can we predict this phenomenon for patient selection? And when we're thinking about, especially now our field is in flux, as we know, how to divert patients to one or another option, predicting the phenomenon before the intervention is important. And so we did some work on this. This is again Omar weaver Pizon when he took the Intermax data, and he looked at this uh, uh, predictive ability of various clinical characteristics, and uh, consistent with what we did in restage and what single center studies confirm now in a multi-center fashion, you can see that the younger the patients, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, the time from cardiac diagnosis, being uh, not cardiorenal uh, with bad kidneys and the heart not being super dilated, I mean, not burn out, these are the people that they tend to respond more. And this is not a cutoff. You have to do cutoff for the predictive score. It's a continuous phenomenon and all these, uh, they have, uh, you can treat them like continuous variables. When you do that, you can just, and we run this score every time in our uh, committee, every uh, Tuesday, so we know uh, and we can focus on the patients with high potential for recovery when we've had them to monitor their heart function with uh, serial echoes. Another thing that we did, uh, and this is Dr. Bonius who trained on uh, torsion and rotational mechanics with Ted Abraham when they were in Hopkins. And when he came to us as a fellow, he asked this question, all of these people have low EF, they get bad. Some of them retain the torsion, not to the degree of a normal heart, but they, are better than others. The ones that they had better torsion and rotational mechanics, these were the ones that they had the potential of reverse remodeling. And if you think about it, it goes consistent with other clinical characteristics, the less burnout, the heart, the less damage, the more the likelihood to reverse the phenomenon. And when you go to the peripheral circulation, talking about biomarkers and practical ways to predict the phenomenon, this is Lauren and Nikos when they were in the lab, now Lauren is an air practitioner and Nikos is junior faculty at Texas Heart. Uh, we found that the decrease in inflammatory burden, and we started from the tissue, we measured the cytokines there, and then we guided our analysis in the serum so we can make it more practical, so you don't need the tissue in order to predict. And what we found there was that uh, interferon gamma and TNF alpha were predictors of response, circulating predictors of response that can be used as biomarkers. Uh, before the intervention. So on the tissue level, an interesting finding was the T-tubule finding. And so what we did there, and this is Thomas, who is now back in Germany, and uh, Frank Sache, one of my collaborators of CBRTI. And you may be familiar with the prionadine receptors and uh, how this is important for the excitation contraction coupling, right? And you can appreciate there on the left, the T-tubules uh, in the normal heart are very well coupled with the RYR, and that's how we get the contractility and the excitation contraction coupling. And then what we found in our patient samples, which was a novel finding, and that goes back to Mike Bristow's point that in the animal models, we cannot recapitulate the chronicity of heart failure. And that's one of the limitations we have in heart failure research, that we don't have really good animal models. Chronic, it's difficult. The humans fail over months and years. You cannot keep the animals for months and years there. And so this is a finding that we wouldn't appreciate in our animal models. And we found in humans, these sheets of T-tubules that they were uncoupled with their ionidine receptors. And when we ran this analysis in our population, we found that the ones that they retain the microstructure on the left side, these were the ones that they were able to respond favorably. Again, going back to what we said, that this is a phenomenon that you can appreciate better in the patients that they still retain their recoverability and they are not burned out. And the associate editorial uh, was talking about this point of no return, which we all look for when we're talking to our patients, which are, and especially now that we can transform people quickly, who are the hearts that we can give up on? Who are the hearts that we say they're tossed? done, but it's replaced it, versus the heart as they still have the potential to come back. And so this is a concept that Dan Berhoff and Dagman uh, 
analyzed in this uh, paper where they talk about the elastic region and the plastic region, like the materials we have, right? And they kind of draw an analogy with the human heart. And when you're in the elastic region, you can still reverse the damage. But when you move beyond that point of no return, you may not be able to do that. And our prior paper and other work that we're doing, and I'll show you some, is trying to define this zone that beyond which you can just say we're done. This heart is done. An important question in the field, because we use these recovery and remission interchangeably, because we don't think that we cure chronic and heterogeneous and complex disease like heart failure. Essentially, it's a remission. But when you go to talk about things, you're going to use the positive word. You're not going to use the negative word. We know that in the heart failure field, we did the mistake to cause to call our disease heart failure. Now we're trying to change it. <laughs> and we cannot. When, it, when it's out, it's out. <laughs> and so here, we didn't do the same mistake. We, we are using the word recovery. We are not using the word remission. But it's the two, op the two phases of the same coin, essentially. And so in this stage, the post-explant uh, survival, uh, free of uh, transplant or LVAD, you can see here the results. And these are consistent with all of the single center reports that they came. To put it in perspective and compare that to what the alternative could be. And what's the alternative? It's transplant. This is data from Herfield, where uh, my partner, Emma Bertz, who is now at the University of Kentucky, and our mentor, Sir Mathiagou, a living legend of cardiovascular disease, who introduced us in this field, in Herfield. Uh, they compare here 40 people, they win the Albats, with 52 people they transplant. And they follow them for up to eight years. And you can see the results. Uh, in their center, the alternative provides equal survival, which makes introduces the point that they've been discussing that for young people, that the durability of the graft is just 13 or 14 years. If you can postpone transplant for later, right, because of the complications of transplant, then you may be able to uh, give them a better long-term therapy. And so these results were repeated by the European uh, Registry of VATS, and the Berlin group, the Texas Heart, and the Ristage sites. And, and as I said, several other centers. But it's not all about survival. Patient reported outcomes, quality of life, exercise capacity, that's important. And so in these patients, these are data from Newcastle, Cambridge, Leeds, and Herfield, where they exercise these people. You can see there with blue, the healthy controls, and you can see with orange circles, the wind patients and their exercise capacity uh, stratified by age. And you can see that they are really doing well exercise capacity wise, especially compared to their patients on LVADs with great triangles or the patients that they are waiting for transplant with uh, uh, the purple squares. And the durability over the years, uh, good results again in these LVAD win uh, people. In order to understand better this, we started a registry uh, to overcome the small numbers from small centers, from single center reports. And this is Neil Patel from Montefiore and I that we and others started this. If you are interested, please uh, reach out and uh, we will be happy to add you. We have now more than 40 adult and pediatric sites and more than 400 patients. These are the, the, the sites uh, in uh, US, Canada, Japan, and Europe. And uh, I'm going to share with you unpublished data now that we just submitted to ICLT uh, the first report. And this is the up to 10 years follow up from these 400 plus patients, the ones that we clean the data. And I think this is an important uh, 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 question that we have in the field whether the heart will forget, right? And you will have. Uh, uh, durability of this remission. And these results consistent with the single center reports. These are now patients from all over the world, diverse group of patients, are comparable to the alternative, which makes again the point that you may be able in younger people, the transplant may not be ideal to postpone this for later. So when we separated the groups, an important finding, which goes back to the fact that this is not an all or none phenomenon, like pregnancy or death, it's a continuous spectrum, like most biological phenomena. Uh, you can appreciate here how the patients that they met the institutional criteria for recovery did better with the other group. And the other group, as your Hartford, your colleagues can share with you, these pumps get complications and sometimes we're stuck. 
And that's what happened in this second group. They looked and they saw, oh, this patient now that has this terrible infection or whatever, the heart is partially recovered. Let's go ahead and take it out. And you can see that these people, as you can expect, didn't do as well as the others, but overall, they did better than you would think, despite the fact that they didn't meet the institutional criteria for recovery. Putting together these two, drawing again the picture of a continuous biological phenomenon. So going back to this uh, Utah Nova cohort, the 358 people, uh, we showed uh, in this paper there how 10% were responders, and these are the people we evaluate for recovery. And let's focus and talk a little bit on this intermediate group, the 30% of patients that they are partial responders. They improve their EF, as we said there, uh, by a median of 9%. And so in this paper, we suggested that you can consider optimizing the guideline-directed medical therapy and the LBAT speed. And maybe you can reserve the donor grafts for the non-responders and work a little bit more on these partial responders as well. And the question that comes up is, is there room for improving GDNT and LVAT speed in our everyday clinical practice? I'm going to share with you two papers that they suggest that there is a lot of room to improve GDNT in our everyday clinical practice. And you can see here from this uh, JAMA cardiology paper that in thousands of LVAT patients, Unfortunately, only 16% were on standard triple therapy. So there's a huge room to improve things in, uh, in these partial responders and get them to reverse three model, as we just uh, showed you before with other studies even more. And then when it comes to hemodynamics, is there room for improvement there? There's lots of room for improvement there. These are two of the studies that showed that. Despite that these patients are doing well, they come to clinic and they seem to be okay. When you cut them, you will find a lot of them, as you can see here, that they are outside what you would consider good hemodynamic range by terms of CVP and wedge. And when you adjust the output speed, you can get them where you need them to be. And this creates <clears throat> the rationale that you may be able to improve things further. How are you going to do that? Are you going to keep cutting people? Cardiomems could help. As you know, cardiomems. Uh, is a way that we can monitor non-invasively uh, the uh, pressures. And this is uh, the study that I had the privilege and the honor to call it with uh, my colleagues. We had uh, 22 sites and we enrolled 101 heart-made elbow patients. The feasibility was the first thing we wanted to see, that there was not going to be an interaction like when you have a bad and a pacemaker. So it worked without creating issues and noise and all this. And then the other thing we uh, showed was that the ones that they reduced the PA diastolic, they had improvements in the six minute walk test. And the ones that they maintained the PA diastolic less than 20, they had lower heart failure hospitalizations. So uh, that's something that it's food for thought and things that we can do that was a pilot and whether we can uh, do studies more uh, to investigate this further. What we discussed last night, uh, and yesterday with some of uh, our colleagues is a proposal we have for a prospective study to use the contemporary GDMT, which is the best we've ever had, and it's getting even better, and use the ELBA as a platform in order to take advantage of this phenomenon. And the target study populations that we are uh, discussing for this study, first is these acute heart failure shock patients that they come and they are GDMT naive, and now the kidneys came back, the patient is still inotrope dependent, you cannot really bridge them to GDMT, but they're great candidates to be transplanted quickly with the new allocation of the system. There's a huge temptation because you can just transplant them within two, three weeks. Is this the best thing to do in a patient who has not seen GDMT? Our guidelines say you not even do ICD in this patient. Are we going to do a transplant? And so that's the first target population. The second target population, and actually before I go there, that's a paper we just published a chart with Veli Tokara and the Columbia Group showing that in 2018, the patients didn't change, but our behavior changed. And the percentage of these patients that they recover went down several times, this subgroup of patients. So that's not something we assume that is happening, it is happening. And the editorial from Rebecca and, uh, and Jennifer, Jen Cowger and Rebecca Coxwell uh, addressed that with the uh, 
title that speaks for itself. Uh, and so that's the first uh, patient population. The second patient population is the ones that they are walking wounded. They are on a touch of entresto, on a touch of beta blocker for two, three weeks. They never tolerated more than that. And we deem them that they are intolerant of GDMT, suboptimal GDMT. They come in, we cut them after a month or six weeks that we tried them. They meet all of the criteria for status two, status three, and we can transplant them quickly. Is this the right thing to do? So that's the equipos, and that's what we are proposing. And the third, and again, this is a continuum of populations, right? The third is the ones that we shared with you before, the risk stage and all these clinical characteristics that they predict response. And so what could be the goals and the impact of a study like this? Enhance the main part function, get responders, get partial responders, rescue some parts, and postpone the transplant, which especially for young people, you talk to pediatric cardiologists, and, or if you talk to our colleagues that they graduate a lot of patients from their pediatric programs, they will tell you that the teenagers that they get transplanted or the kids, they just die young. And this applies also to our patients that we transplant when they are 20, 30, 40 years old. They will need more than one transplant. And in the meantime, they will get the complications from immunosuppression that you cannot uh, deal with. We were talking how we're trying to do better with the biology and the immunosuppression, but we're not there yet. So long story short, this is something that be a, can be especially attractive in young and middle-aged people. We can see whether the Duke data apply and you can get even more uh, improved alpha outcomes in these partial responders and respond and make more of them to respond if we adjust uh, the alpha speed and use better GDMT. And then it's going to improve the allocation of the precious gift of donation because you will be able, the heart that you will rescue from these patients to give to all these people that they are waiting, all of these congenitals, you, you have a congenital big program here, all of these other hypertrophics that they don't have a path because they don't meet this status two crime, they just wait there forever. And, and some of them have bad outcomes. And so, and the last thing, of course, it's gonna help us advance the science of recovery, which as we will see later, the benefit can be for the broader half lift field, not just for the advance and develop new therapeutic targets, which is a segue to the second part, which is gonna be a little bit abbreviated, some of our efforts to understand the biology driving this uh, findings that I just shared with you. And this is an invited paper at JHLT. This is a new feature they have. They have companion review articles, one focus on the clinical aspects and one focus on the biological. So they invited us to wrote with our collaborators from all over the country and the world, these two papers. And this is the biological review. And you can appreciate their summary. It's out of the scope to go through all of the details. But a few years earlier, we convened at the NHLBI, we had this working group where I had the honor uh, to call it with my colleagues that you see listed there. And the recommendations were published in the journals of the major societies that they are stakeholders in this. And what we described there is our vision for the field to advance this beyond the end stage and impact the greater, broader field of heart failure. So we get the tissue, as you know, when the VAT goes in, this is an unprecedented opportunity for cardiovascular medicine. And it's one of the reasons that oncology is so far ahead of us in precision medicine, because they always had access to the precious culprit human tissue, and they didn't rely only on animal models and in vitro studies. And they could couple those studies with their human tissue studies. So that's an unprecedented opportunity. And that's what we described in that working group recommendations. Then you can phenotype the patients. And as we said, this is a continuous phenomenon. It's not all or none. And then you know when you take the heart, a transplant, or when you recover and you biopsy, you know what changed. But this cannot be always causal. It just can be human association. So the approach we follow in our translational program is to do the first step studies on this human tissue to screen for these changes and then move to the second step to prove the causality, which you need studies now in small animals and in vitro to see whether these changes on the human tissue are causal or are just epiphenomena. And when you find that, the idea is to bring it back as a therapeutic target. I'm gonna share with you two or three examples. We cannot go through all of the details, but I'm gonna share with you two or three examples, published and unpublished. This is where the patients and the samples come from all over the mountain west and beyond and collaborators 
from uh, the rest uh, of the country. Uh, and non-failing donor hearts, we have 42 of those. We collect about two or three per year. It's very hard to find unused uh, healthy hearts that we get because of infections or other reasons. So the first time we did this screening in responders and non-responders and the groups in between, we came up with this pathway analysis. And as you can see there, and as we would expect, there's not only one thing that is reversing and changing. And you, we grouped the pathways there. And then we went back to the clinical to see whether we can get some clues from the time course of this phenomenon on where to focus. So this is a paper that Omar have published again when he was doing his research fellowship with us. And when we take this responder group and we plot the time course of the response, and we were talking with April about this yesterday, this happens relatively quickly. Within one to two months, you will see the signals. And then within three to six months, you will get a lot of this response. And so that's why, based on these and some other findings we had in the lab, we started from the metabolism where changes can happen quickly. And so again, I'm not gonna go through all of the details, but the first piece of work that uh, we put out following this strategy was this cell metabolism paper where we focus on the pyruvate lactate uh, metabolism. We did the step one in the heart tissue and the step two in the lab. Uh, it's, I think, uh, out of the scope to go through all of the details. Uh, there's a lot of findings there in vitro and in vivo small animals in order to prove this step two, that this can be causal. The MCT4 came up the lactate exporter uh, inhibitor as a potential therapeutic target. And we published that and we are working now on how to develop this in large animals and bring it back to humans as a potential therapy. One of the things that we're doing, which is novel, is that the metabolism, as you know, is complex. And uh, we're doing flux. We're giving label substrates in humans and in animals in order to know when we take the tissue, whether it went through one or the other uh, pathway of uh, cardiac metabolism, which is the gold standard. And it has not been done in uh, the heart. It has been done only in cancer. And uh, we are very hopeful that we will learn a lot. Another thing that it came out of these studies that we are screening in humans was uh, the calcium homeostasis. And again, this is just plotting the whole process that how you phenotype, how we get the responders and the non-responders. And then we did RNA sequencing and phosphoproteomic. We merged them. And the thing that came out, one of them was this calcium homeostasis and the VDAC2, the voltage dependent anion channel 2, came out as something that was differentially expressed at the protein and gene expression level between responders and non-responders. And so we followed and we did the step two studies here that is summarized in this nature communication paper that just came out. These are published, both of these. So I'm not gonna go into details. You can find the details published. I'm gonna share with you a little bit on our work on fibrosis based on what we discussed with April yesterday. And uh, you may have seen our paper that just came out last week. And we have now even more people and in this paper in circulation is the step one of the studies essentially, which we combine the clinical data, the echocardiographic data, and the response we get there with the proteomic and with the transcriptomic. And the two major pathways that came out was the cell cycle changes and the extracellular matrix changes. And when we got it down to, I would uh, focus today a little bit on the fibrosis development and the extracellular matrix, uh, AEBP1 was one of the targets that was identified. And we went after that in the lab, step two studies, as we said before, to prove causality, to make sure this is not just an epiphenomenon and an association you find in humans. And by doing the knockdowns and the overexpression, we showed that you get the fibroclast to be activated when you uh, overexpress AEBP1, when you knock it down, you get that you prevent this fibroblast activation, which leads to fibrosis. And then we went to the uh, MI model of heart failure. And when we knocked it down, we prevented the uh, progression of fibrosis and we improved the heart function. And then when we went to a systemic model of fibrosis and we uh, administered angiodensin 2 and phenylephrine, we saw a reduction of fibrosis and hypertrophy. Again, starting from the human, going to watch changes on the tissue, and then going in the lab, seeing whether this is causal and mechanistic, trying to bring it back now as a therapeutic target. So these are three examples, two published and one unpublished, following this way of starting from the human, 
from the bedside, getting to the bench, and trying now with our collaborators with uh, industry, the pharma, to bring it back as a therapeutic target. This is Dr. Tseyu, who led uh, the other review, not the clinical, the biological review we published. Uh, and she's one of our PSDP candidates graduating now from our heart failure program as a fellow. And we talked before about the heterogeneity of the disease. And we showed some evidence about this heterogeneity earlier. And we are doing this in the adults, but the heterogeneity there, as we discussed yesterday in our shock talk, is remarkable. And the comorbidities, the mitigation, aging adds to this heterogeneity. And so in the pediatric population, the, the advantage is that we have less heterogeneity, less comorbidities, less medications, plus the recoverability, we have evidence that it may be even uh, higher, plus transplantation, the younger you are, the less attractive the option because of the durability of the graft and the complications you get in cancer and all these with immunosuppression and the animal models, of course. So some of these targets that I shared with you and some that we didn't have time to share that we are investigating in all these uh, lines of investigation with collaborators that you see contributed in this uh, paper with us and others that they are not listed there. And the opportunity, of course, to reverse remodel the heart and create uh, 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 therapies uh, for heart failure. So in summary, what have we learned and what are the future directions? Predictors of response before LVAD implantation. Clinical characteristics, age, duration of heart failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, degree of LV dilation, and kidney function. Single center studies, then confirmed by multi-center studies. Echo rotational mechanics and torsion can also help you predict response before the intervention. Circulating cytokines like TNF-alpha and interferon gamma and the T-tubal microstructure. Guided by these predictors, you can select your population and recover the patient's more than 50% likelihood, uh, guided by this. If you go to the all comers, non-selected, consecutive patients, just to get a grasp of what the impact to the whole field could be, this is not an ordinary phenomenon. This is not like pregnancy and death. This is a continuous phenomenon like most biological phenomena, and you would expect 10% responders 30% non-responders, the way we define them and the opportunity there to improve them even further with hemodynamic uh, speed adjustment and with uh, a GDMT. And the long-term sustainability, as you saw, is excellent, similar to the alternative and the excellent exercise capacity that uh, we share with you. This is reproducible in many centers nationally and internationally and registries. And the biology, which is important, to have biological explanations for what you see and drives. It's being intensively investigated and creates an opportunity to develop targets and therapies that they can just delete everything. And we don't need bats, we don't need transplants, we improve the GDMT so much that we don't allow these people to go to advanced therapies. That's the hope, that's the vision. To use this model and start from a well-tracked population in order to advance the whole field. These are the two reviews. We didn't have time to review everything, but this is uh, suggestions for more on the clinical aspects of this phenomenon. And in the clinical companion review, we included Manrit Panwar from Allegheny, uh, let the effort there, and you can see people from all over the world, pediatric and adult programs, practical ways to start recovery programs, simple how you monitor, how you uh, practical tables and figures and the biological aspects in the companion review. Every year we do our recovery symposium, and this year Cricket Salmon will be our keynote. Uh, we used to do it, as Nazim knows, uh, right before the MLK weekend, because the main reason people come is to go to the mountains and play. And so we changed it to COVID in March, then people left March, now it's going to happen in person, and it's going to be March this year. We are experimenting to see. It's going to be a regular weekend, not a long weekend. We always do it uh, Thursday, Friday, and then people... We unleash people to the mountains, but uh, people have participated uh, uh, from your center. Claudius was there, gave a talk uh, a while ago. And uh, if you have trainees or others that they would like to present, uh, we don't publish the abstracts on purpose, so they can still submit them to AJ and ACC and other bigger conferences. We just discuss science and uh, this is our team. We do uh, one funny picture per year. We stop for COVID. We are overdue for another one. 
and we do also a series one per year. And um, uh, of course, uh, it takes a village. And I would like to thank all of the collaborators uh, in our institution and many other collaborators in other institutions uh, for the work. And of course, our uh, funding, uh, the sources of funding uh, that you can uh, see listed there. And with this, uh, I hope I left time, oh yeah, good, for discussion. And I would like to thank you for your attention and again, for this wonderful invitation to be here with you today. Um, we have time for a lot of questions. Um, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you a microphone so that everybody can hear uh, your questions. Uh, Rob? Like, talk really loud. Perfect. Or maybe we yeah. can uh, we can give you this. Can we give? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, first, uh, good, fantastic talk, Stavos. Um, can I ask you just a clarifying question? It's about the recovery population, and you showed that nice um, graph showing uh, survival post uh, explantation that looked like uh, it was similar to post-transplant, or you showed one where there was survival, and I think out of 10 years, there was a 50% survival. It's about midway. My, my question to you actually isn't about the survival. It is, what is the uh, rate of, of uh, recurrent LV dysfunction in the population, not just survival? Because Absolutely. And, and that's a great question. And, and that's why I showed the exercise capacity results. In the interest of time, I didn't show the results on the recurrence of heart failure and LV dysfunction, which is what the question is. And we have evidence from the registry that we are gonna present in ICHLT. I cannot really present everything in the interest of time, but it's consistent with the results we have from Berlin and Texas Heart. And I would say the five year, it's about 67 freedom from recurrence of heart failure. Five year, okay. at five years, 67%. So this is something that I think we can, based on the studies we're doing now, and that's why we are proposing to do this other study, we can define better in the future who are these patients that they have sustainable remission, even further than that. So we can improve it even more than the transplant, uh, post-transplant survival, right? And, and what are what is the quality of life and the patient reported outcomes of the patients that they get to have recurrence? Because what we are finding is that the ones that they get a recurrence and they are stable outpatients, New York Heart Association class one or two, this is fine. If you are a partial responder and you have good quality of life, these are the things that we are doing right now. But that's a great question, and that's why we did this registry, so we can get multi-center data, and so we can have long-term outcomes and go, get to this question, not just for the LV dysfunction, but also quality of life. At one point, Doug, Doug Mann was looking at trying to look for differences between not responders, but within responders sustained and and and, and perhaps you know, uh, temp well, I'm not saying temporary, when they were reintroduced to a hemodynamic load. Um, and if I remember the data correctly, he was suggesting that there were epigenetic changes and changes in, in methylation in all of the patients, but that those who were um, not sustained recovery seemed to have a persistent epigenetic signature that suggested that they were fundamentally different than the other group. And I just wonder if your group has had a chance to sort of sort out between yeah. those two, uh, what differences, because yes. if you're postulating a hypothesis around that, it can't, uh, I understand why metabolism might explain the early, but it wouldn't explain this sustained uh, exactly. difference. I agree. And you mentioned Dagman, who is a great mentor and a collaborator, and Corey Lavine, his uh, mentee, who now has a very strong lab. As you saw, we 
we have been working together closely. So that's a great question and a great point. We have a K award. Omar Weaver Pinzon is now, his K is focused on epigenetics of myocardial recovery and he's investigating this actively. And uh, I think that what we will show soon is similar to what Doug showed. And it seems that, and, and Doug make that point with his uh, mice data as well, that these patients that they reverse remodel, they don't go back to where they start from. They go to another status. And these epigenetic changes and this change of the biological signature and the molecular signature you see in these people, if you do gene expression, metabolomics, proteomics, and you put a circle, this is the normal, this is the failing. The ones that they reverse the model, they don't go back to normal. They go to another status. And from that status, as you said, we have the ones that they will have sustained remission and the ones that they won't. And epigenetics play a significant role there, as you suggested. And that's what Omar is investigating now. I don't have the full results and the full answer yet, but I'm glad that the NIH uh, agreed and, and, and provided the funding to complete this work. Fantastic talk. Um, just a question about predictors of recovery. Um, I was surprised that fibrosis was not included. Have you guys looked at that? I'm, I'm a myocyte biologist. I like to think yes. that the myocyte is everything. Can you comment on that? It's, it's, it's a great question. We were very surprised and we looked at it. And we looked at it in a lot of people, more than 150. And in this ABP1 work that I showed you, the whole project started because of that. Because we were uh, very uh, surprised when we saw that. And I don't know if I have it here to show you the data. I think I do. Okay, uh, let me... Here it is. So, what shocked us when we looked at fibrosis was that in these 142 people, we all think that fibrosis is a hallmark of heart failure. And especially when you are end stage advanced. When I saw there that we had a big group of patients that their fibrosis range was within donor heart range, I was like, oh my God, we're gonna report this. People will begin throwing things to us. They will say, you put that in people, they don't have heart failure. They don't have fibrosis, what are you doing there? Right? So we went back, we look at these people, they were sick like dogs. They were sick as the other ones. But we went again, we analyzed everything, the fibrosis. So, and then the German group published that as well. And they just published this histology study. We're doing the mechanistic study and it's gonna take some time. But what we found there was that this low fibrosis group that you can appreciate there, which was uh, the first finding, and then the high fibrosis group. And then when we look at the results, of the responders and the non-responders. And that's how this project started. We found that in the responders, there was a decrease in the interstitial fibrosis. That was epicardium to endocardium. So that explains in our mind why we didn't find it. Because it seems, and we talked with April about it yesterday, that there is a point of no return when it comes in the interstitial fibrosis. And there are more data now from AES and other populations that these are just similar things, that when we talk about interstitial fibrosis, you can really reverse uh, some of that. And that's the work we're doing now with ABP1, and that's the motivation to do that focus. Because as we showed you earlier, there are a lot of things that they came up in these omics screenings. And then we picked the ones that they were more interesting and more important. I hope this answers your question. Uh, fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if in uh, the registries or the smaller studies, if MRI data, particularly presence, quantity, or pattern of LGE has been a predictor of recovery, yes. especially as it regards to torsion. Yes, that's a great question. We would love to do that. And thank him before going to Northwestern, uh, who is an MRI expert was working with our MRI group, who, as Nazem knows, is very active from our work with say, FIB and Carmine. And we were trying to do that. The problem, as you know, is the pacemakers. 
that most of these people have, and they create the artifact. So they did a lot of work to remove the artifact and get to the point that we can do that. And we are getting some results, but that's the reason we delayed a lot. And that's a great question and suggestion, of course, because you, you want to use a non-invasive way uh, and the best imaging we have, right, in order to get to it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Excellent product. Uh, Thank you. Fibrosis is sort of a, a final off pathway, and you see that there is uh, inflammation that also predicts whether people respond or not. What about inflammation that they target for therapy and uh, in terms of uh, including on else? Yeah, I'm glad you're asking this question. We talked about Dagman, and when it comes to inflammation, we are reminded of how our field works sometimes something bad comes out and everybody moves away. And when the Renaissance study and the TNF alpha uh, inhibition didn't work, people moved away, running away. I'm glad that now people are revisiting this with work by Paul Ritger and Sumanth Prabhu and Doug and others. And this is, I couldn't agree more with you, one of the things we are planning to do. That's why we're collaborating with Corey Levine. The difficult thing when it comes to inflammation, and that's what we learned over the years, is how to dissect the bad from the good, because there's some good there as well. And, 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 and that's what is the challenge. Uh, find a way to, to dissect that. Uh, we are doing some work that may be helpful to help us intervene and, and dissect that but uh, it's not ready for prime time. But the direction that you suggested makes so much sense. And I couldn't agree more. Right. So one comment, don't be afraid of people throwing stuff at you. Those are the people who change healthcare. The, the people who don't throw are the ones who don't change healthcare. And you come from a heart failure program that's always pushed the envelope. And often things that were thought to be wrong ended up being right. And things that you thought would be right ended up being wrong. So I think that's an important message for everybody. Uh, being just a dumb knuckle dragger, a lot of the stuff with LVADs, I wonder is what are the predictors of the RV and what the RV is doing on the ability to explant yeah. the devices? Because even the, the ones you showed, the, the one who responded, the RV looked pretty good. And the one that didn't respond, the RV looked pretty yep. bad. So are there plans or therapies or thoughts about how to deal yes. with the RV? So that's a great question, uh, Bill. Thank you for bringing it up. We just had this NHLPI Harvey workshop and Ryan Tedford gave the RV talk there. And it's amazing how much we neglected the RV. I mean, it goes back to the butcher of my mentor in his village, making fun of him. What are you doing all these years, John? He goes like, I cut the brain. It's so complex. I cut the heart. It's just four holes. What are you guys doing all these years? And then my mentor goes like, and imagine two of the four, we have no clue. <laughs> it's even worse. So it has a lot of missed opportunity when it comes to the RV. And uh, in our case here, and we've looked into that, obviously, it could be the case many times that you fully recover the left ventricle and the RV is the problem. And because part of the criteria is the hemodynamics, the hemodynamics don't look good. The index is not going to look good because the RV cannot support, right? How do you make the RV to work better? Is it because this unloading of the, you know, the afterload reduction in the pulmonary pressures is not enough because there are other things happening? We optimize the speed so we can get the IBS in the middle. We do all these things. The anti-remodeling mitigations and their effect on the RV also is not very well understood, right? And so what we are doing now is focusing there, trying to understand better first with clinical work and some translational. And it would have been great if we were able to biopsy this patient serially and see how the RV is changing during support, right? But because of the coumadin that these people are on and it's too invasive, that's not easy to do. Uh, you know that we come from a program that not easy things can happen and Bristol and Mike uh, have done some of these biopsies as we and others know here. But... Uh, yeah, we, we are thinking of that to get this tissue. But on the clinical side, we are trying to understand it better. The message that I want to send is that for the most part, the RV follows, but not always. But not always. Another question. 
Stavros, this is fascinating. It's great uh, to see how far you've come. I've been listening to your lecture for many years and congratulations. Um, I remember listening to you showing some images, um, including one that of a patient who did recover when you explanted, who didn't have an ICD. So my question is uh, related to that a little bit. One of the predictor slides you showed the presence of ICD was actually a predictor of poor response. Does that maybe speak for some chronicity uh, of the condition? Yeah. Or maybe that point of no return? Yeah. My related question is, is there a prescription? Do you aim to put these patients on GDMT, be aggressive? What do you do with CRT in these patients? And then tying to your talk from last night, is there sort of an early approach to shock patients where you maybe want to be very aggressive, offer them an LVAD early, create this opportunity for very aggressive GDMT, maybe give them a chance of recovery? Yes, I'm gonna start from the last, that's exactly the first subpopulation we are targeting with the study we're proposing. That's exactly the subpopulation. And we, we couldn't agree more there. That, and we feel strongly that this should be investigated. And it's the best for these patients, at least to try that and give it a shot. Uh, the, the second question you asked was about the ICD as a predictor. And in that analysis, the absence of the ICD, the first interpretation we had, because the absence, the presence it was a surrogate, for us, it was a surrogate of early disease. And that's why they didn't have an ICD because people were waiting. That's what we said before, right? The, the guidelines tell you don't put uh, in recent onset people uh, cardiomyopathy ICD unless you try GDMT. And so they recover them, they recover with the VATS. And that's why I think it came up in this study. So uh, the third, I think, Nazem was what do we do after we explant and whether we actually, what do we do with the CRT, right? during support nobody knows i don't know what you guys do here you keep it on or you turn it off sure. it's variable and you've seen the crossover study from the university of chicago that showed that there's some benefit on turning it off actually but uh, the, the results are conflicting and we need more evidence there another issue that is related to the ep is what are you going to do in patients that you recovered they came with shock they didn't have an icd now they recover but are you going to leave them without an ICD now? They don't meet the criteria because the AF is not where it should be to get reimbursed. But that's another thing that we are planning to address in the registry because it's an open question. This is not any patient. This is a patient that went all the way to the, the store, right? And came back. And so like Lazarus. So do you leave them without an ICD, all this investment that the program did and the patient and the family and all this? And, and that's also an unanswered question that we're hoping to answer. And the responses we get from centers is variable. Like some people just put it in. So if the patient has half free recurrence, as Rob said, you at least have the ICD there to protect them or whatever. And then the CRT, it's a very, uh, again, going back, almost embarrassing that we don't know what to do you know, about patients with the CRT. Yeah. Star Wars, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.